Siamo al Mido e... Martin Mido. In the last few years, for about five to six years, we have been involved uh, with the vision defense uh, to screening and prevention programs all over Italy. The title of this workshop uh, is Vision and Driving. I'm Demetra Spinelli, chairman of the Italian Society of Legal Ophthalmology and of Vision Pionless, and I have also been director of the eye clinic at Polyclinical Hospital in Milan. I will tell you something about uh, the physiopathological mechanism of vision and the eye conditions in relationship to uh, driving. So we have the vision and visual functions that are driven by visual acuity, the visual field, chromatic sense, light sense, and stereoscopic sense. Vabbè, era chiuso, ha ragione. There are physiopathological mechanisms underlying this function and they are really very complex. Uh, let's uh, now uh, restate the main ones. Uh, the first component uh, is connected with the presence of photometers or photoreceptors, 120, 130 light sensors, uh, the so-called rods and cones. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, green, blue and red sensitive cones. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, for them to work, we need to have a high level of light. And uh, they have got uh, a great power to, of separation and directionality. Then we have rods, uh, which can also work at a very low light level with a poor resolution and directionality power. Then we have a second element, which is extremely important in vision, i.e. internal diffraction uh, um, caused by the pupils, uh, so that an object uh, that is perceived as a light dot on a back black background, uh, the smallest star we see in the sky, is actually present on the retina as a concentric uh, series of diffraction bands covering an angle with 1.30 degrees. So it's not just involving one photoreceptor, but at least six to eight photoreceptors. If this tiny object becomes uh, brighter and lighter, it will be perceived as if it were larger. And this is extremely important, most of all in ametropia, which is not properly correct or, or not corrected at all, because because we have an enlargement of diffraction circles, which becomes a larger, the uh, more severe, the residual ametropia. The number of quantums reaching the retina is always the same. It doesn't change. So if they are diluted on a larger surface, the target will be perceived with less contrast. And in extreme cases, it won't be perceived at all when its lightness uh, is below a certain differential threshold as opposed to the background. Uh, sorry for the technical inconvenience. If, on the contrary, the observed object is dark on a light background, we have the opposite phenomenon. If we increase the background lightness, we cannot have a darker than black, gradually the object will become smaller in size because it's sort of concealed by the diffraction bands of the light edge so that it's 
becomes no longer visible. An everyday example is uh, glare, for instance. So this peculiarity of our vision system could uh, uh, induce a driver, which is pretty well, not to see a pedestrian when wearing dark garments uh, close to a light source, uh, which is very powerful. So we might uh, have a scene in spotlights, for instance. A further evolution of the visual system is constituted by the so-called receptive fields. Another fundamental point we need to consider relates to to understand the function of the visual system is that we have not a single component, just some central cones in the center of the fovea function together. So for vision to, to take place properly, we need to have group stimulation in the receptive field, stimulation of a group of photoreceptors causes facilitation or inhibition, i.e. less sensitivity, of uh, uh, the closer elements. For drivers, this is of paramount importance. If the peripheral retina is activated by a moving object after a short latency time, the photoreceptors that are along the way are alerted. They are sort of activated or facilitated, while the back ones and the lateral ones are inhibited. I conditions and driving. Road safety is fundamental for society as a whole. These are the latest statistics. There have been 3,653 death cases in 2012 in 186,726 road accidents with 264 and 716 injured. The drivers who seem to be most involved are usually over 80 and younger than 24. For the over 80, um, this has got mainly got to do with visual and cognitive impairment. Uh, so proper uh, vision is one of the key drivers for safe driving. Um, 85 to 90 percent of the sensorial inputs reaching the brain are required for proper uh, driving and they are connected with visual perceptions. So there's evidence that visual impairment can cause road accidents, but it's not clear what kind of vision is required for, road, for safe uh, driving. Very quickly, what are the main eye conditions interfering with everyday activities and most of all with driving? Cataract, glaucoma, hemianopsia, diabetic retinopathy, age-driven maculopathy and diplopia. Here I'm going to show you how a driver can see when he or she is suffering from one of these eye conditions with cataract, for instance. This is what the driver is going to see. On the left-hand side, you see the normal picture, and in the, the two small photos on the right-hand side, you see a patient with progressed uh, cataract, uh, and on the right, uh, the, his perception uh, of a, a car driving in the opposite direction. These are visual uh, field alteration in glaucoma. Uh, here you see they are progressive over time. We have the onset of the condition, and in the lower part on the right hand side, you have a, a progressed glaucoma, a terminal glaucoma. This is another patient on the right hand side, hemianopsia. You see the right hand side of the road is not seen properly. This is yet another picture. Here you see. This is how a patient with a hemianopsia will see. This is uh, uh, the picture perceived by patient with diabetic retinopathy. The visual field uh, encompasses different scotomas. Uh, they have different uh, size, uh, they are of different kind. And this is uh, the picture seen by in macular degeneration, which is age driven. Here you see on the right hand side, uh, there's a major, a very severe scotoma. And this is diplopia. This is how a patient sees uh, the, a car in front.
front of him. By way of conclusion, uh, what are the functions to be assessed? Uh, first of all, visual acuity, contrast uh, sensitivity by low, uh, twilight vision, um, sensitivity to glare, recovery time after glare, and visual field. Uh, we can conclude that vision is an extremely complex process and the fundamental requirement is uh, the ability to locate a tiny dot in space uh, or for instance light uh, in a fog when driving. The methods we are now using which are imposed by law to discriminate uh, whether people should be allowed uh, to drive or not uh, present some constraints and limitations so they can be still improved. On the one hand you, uh, you run the risk of not detecting dangerous visual uh, gaps or blind uh, spots uh, for drivers. And on the other hand, uh, you would have very good drivers that are n uh, prevented from driving after eyesight tests. Uh, let me just hand over to Franco Giacotti. Good morning. I'm Franco Giacotti, member of the Council of Vision Plus, chaired by Professor Spinelli. It's not easy to take the floor after him in a scientific meeting where we are talking about eyes and visual conditions. I am leaving the evidence of what he has told us. I'm not a researcher. I suffer from amblyopia. I've got so-called lazy eyes. You all know what amblyopia is. I'm a testimonial of that, so to say. Here you see uh, how occlusion works. Many years ago, there were no screening tests uh, at school age. My parents have only realized I had lazy eyes when I was seven or eight. I was listening to the ophthalmologist talking with my father. You will never convince him where uh, this uh, mechanism to cover one eye. That's why I've got one tenth in one eye and I can see very well in the other eye. All my life long has therefore been affected by that. My father would feel guilty because I was I could hardly see from one eye so uh, here you see no guns, uh, of course no boxing, uh, no tennis. Uh, what are the pros of amblyopia? There are also some pros uh, associated with amblyopia. One uh, I was no military, no night duties during the military service. When I have started to drive, I was actually paying more attention to road safety because I could hardly see uh, from this eye. So when I was uh, learning to drive, uh, I was really paying great attention. I was turning my hand laterally to make sure everything was okay. And this uh, has affected uh, the following life. I'm a very bad at tennis player. All of my friends I think I'm a bad tennis player because of this eye condition, but this doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I have this eye condition. But I'm just telling to my friends by way of apology for the fact that I'm not a good tennis player. In 24 years I've had a road accident, a car accident. Um, uh, quite an old uh, driver which has uh, actually not given me priority. He has passed away. I haven't been injured. My former girlfriend had to stay in hospital for three days, so we were lucky enough. But this has had a major impact on my life afterwards, despite the fact that I was not liable at all for this road accident. This has happened on the left-hand side, so I was some way in doubt since the other driver was coming 
was approaching me from the left hand side, I was afraid that this might uh, have had an impact on my reaction time. So 40 years later, when I see cars approaching me from the left hand side, I tend to slow down. Uh, at about 30, I have happened to go to Automobile Club, to the Car Drivers Club, and uh, there were several options. Uh, they were searching for a road safety officer, and this is what I have been doing since uh, then at the Stresa conference and uh, the car racing uh, uh, formula, formula One in Monza. I have been involved in road safety issue in the field of communication. I'm not uh, a technologist. So what does it mean? Uh, this is a table with more recent data. Here you see we have fewer road accidents. In 2017, there has been an uprise trend compared with the 2012 to 3,200 death cases. This was a record level. 20% of the road accidents is driven by uncertain driving style, actually. And it's always very difficult to classify univocally the causes of road accidents. So uncertain driving, which is often considered as one of the main causes for road accidents, is actually a set of uh, several causes. Uh, I still believe that uh, there are no univocal causes uh, for car accidents. So the road, for instance, uh, this is a photo. Uh, you know, when you don't have a safe drainage system, when the macadamization is not rainproof, there might be an interference from wet surfaces. Uh, I remember the first tests of this self-draining macadam coating were close to the northern borders of Italy in the Brennero route. There was an experimental part coated with this, and I have perceived that the other drivers were actually driving much faster in this experimental part and at the end of that uh, there has been a severe accident because people were actually driving so fast. So I have started exploring the topic at Monza at the F1 loop. We have really started a test uh, with this uh, uh, rain draining coating uh, you know you need to have a com compatible tires car tires and this has enabled us uh, to draw attention of researchers of innovators to road safety and rain draining macadam coating another problem is of course a road sign uh, and how you lay out road signs. Here you see 130, if you drive 130 kilometer per hour, it's not easy to figure out where you have to go, whether right or left. Uh, this is extremely challenging for tourists or for people who are not familiar with the place. It's really difficult to tell where you have to do. It's not because you are an uncertain driver that you might have an accident. There's too much information here and it's not easy to figure out where you have to go. Another possible cause uh, vehicles. Um, you know, we have several variables, drivers and vehicles, two examples, an old car, look at the old steering wheel, look at the scratches when insurance companies were not reimbursing front glasses, so now we have more safety because of that. The professor Spinelli was talking about this glare effect and the eye conditions, of course, also the conditions of the car uh, and most of all front vision can have an impact. We are all using mobile phones and GPS systems uh, despite legal constraints and also GPS and navigation systems. Uh, if they were designed uh, to be seen in safety when you are driving, uh, this would, we would have have a safer context here I might be distracted by looking at the display of the navigation system. 
uh, the drivers. Well, here we have problems that are more closely connected with what Professor Spinelli was describing earlier on. Last year, we have organized a meeting on professional conditions of professional truck drivers. Among all the conditions, there are also eye conditions, but not only. We can broaden the field, the new traffic code imposes more severe limits for night apnea, for instance. You know, when you're more tired, when you haven't slept for many hours, this might impair your reaction time and your ability to drive safely. This is another aspect we should consider with a group of medical doctors and with Rotary Association. We are now promoting awareness around of these topics. Here you see other elements to be considered. Of course, we should also consider uh, what kind of actions we can put put in place to promote more road safety. And I'm saying that as a counselor of Vision Plus, we need to promote awareness among professionals. With this group of medical doctors, we are working on the fact that GPs should receive information to be assessed and submitted when it comes to their patients. So GPs who know that um, one of the patients is a truck driver or a sales rep who is driving a lot. If uh, he has eye conditions, uh, then special uh, safety rules should apply. We can promote awareness also in the field of labor safety, night apnea, sleep apnea, for instance, like uh, eye conditions. This is a typical case where truck drivers will find it difficult to acknowledge that they suffer from night apnea. The same goes for eye testing. Rotary has set up a working group. Vision Plus is involved in this initiative. We would like to grant fellowships to research further. Before I close and thank you, I would like to tell you something which has happened quite recently to me. I have had a shoulder and neck pain for three or four months. The physiotherapists have seen that I was writing down some notes one day, so I'm older than 60, and they have told me that this is driven by amblyopia and my wrong postural approach. So my life has all been influenced or some way affected by my amblyopia. Thank you. Thank you. At the end of the speeches, we shall have a debate. While Professor Sanjuolo gets... visual uh, acuity uh, with digital systems to end uh, uh, with the view of those road signs at 130 degrees uh, uh, kilometers per hour if you have patients without eye diseases uh, when speed increases uh, uh, the visual field decreases you know what the visual field is it is what we see horizontally but also vertically uh, looking forward, if you increase the speed, if you reach 200, 300 kilometers per hour, the visual field becomes a tubular visual field. It is important uh, to consider it and also for the placement of road signs. I give the floor to Raffaele Sangiolo. Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation, Demetra Spinelli and colleagues. I'm very glad uh, to be here. With regard uh, to the visual field, uh, we carried out studies uh, on the useful uh, visual field. Uh, we're not interested in driving what uh, the usual limits of the visual field uh, of a person uh, uh, is, but uh, the working visual field uh, in an area of the visual field uh, within which uh, the perceived points uh, can reduce a sensor motor reaction and uh, at a speed of a 130 kilometers per hour the working visual field of a person has uh, uh, 30 global degrees uh, uh, that is further reduced 
if uh, you have cognitive overload, for example, telephone conversation. Well, does it work, the pointer? This project originated uh, from the need uh, to review uh, visual criteria to grant uh, driving licenses. The present regulation uh, uh, is not precise, uh, and uh, death rates uh, on the roads uh, for sure uh, increase as a result of this. In my opinion, uh, unlike what most of my colleagues uh, think it's inadequate uh, to define a uh, uh, level to grant a driving license by simply assessing individual parameters uh, separately, because uh, uh, vision is something dynamic and all the various factors uh, continuously interact. So this project originated uh, from the need uh, to review the criteria to grant uh, a driving license. For this reason, uh, we thought uh, to create a, a global visual index uh, taking into account all the various parameters uh, during driving. A global visual index uh, compared uh, to preset reference values. Uh, this global visual index uh, should allow to define uh, uh, levels uh, to grant uh, driving license each time. Uh, that in the various medical committees that uh, I was part of, uh, well, we had two big difficulties. First of all, to define uh, 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 if the person is fit to drive, and we also didn't have the easy instruments uh, to provide uh, specific answers uh, with uh, standardized procedures. So we set at a table uh, with researchers, and for six years uh, we tried to solve uh, such problems. With regard to the Global Visual Index, uh, we proceeded like this. Uh, we had a naive visit, taking into account uh, binocular visual acuity, uh, working a visual field uh, uh, based on the parameters I talked about before, stereoscopy, uh, contrast sensitivity, and uh, time of recovery after glare. Some say such same patients uh, had uh, a driving test at the simulator with scenarios uh, created specifically for that purpose uh, to modulate uh, different visual factors in various sectors. The result of the driving uh, test at the simulator was quantified uh, through a specific score for each subject, and then then we combined the two results uh, with the method based on the implementation of the fuzzy logic. It allowed us uh, to assign uh, to each uh, uh, visual factor a value uh, showing its uh, relative uh, importance. Uh, and uh, if you are accustomed uh, to thinking uh, with uh, mathematical uh, conventional logics, it might seem strange. If you are interested, I can give you details of the fuzzy logic. It's a lengthy process. We shall speak about it later. So, the value of the visual index is defined by the combination uh, of the relative value and the result of the examination of each individual factor at the eye visit. And uh, that's the first uh, uh, problem we solved. The other problem, reliable instrument. We created a high-definition digital instrument that provides uh, precise answers obtained uh, through highly standardized procedures uh, and uh, procedures uh, that can be perfectly reproduced so that it can be used in practice. I was supported by SOI and for each sector I was supported uh, uh, by the various uh, national opinion leaders. Uh, that's uh, a picture of the instrument. Uh, we speak about uh, the prototype uh, that we used uh, years ago uh, to then have a patent. Now we have uh, considerable improvements. Uh, the instrument is more compact and can be easily transported. Uh, visual acuity. Visual acuity uh, 
was measured uh, with uh, an eye chart. He says nothing new. Uh, the ex examination of the visual field, uh, uh, it is extremely precise. I should extend my thanks in this case uh, to my friend uh, Paolo Brosini, who uh, gave his uh, long experience uh, in the sector, is a world opinion leader. And you see, the visual field uh, is uh, examined and assessed uh, perfectly. It's wonderful. Just as if uh, it were a diagnostic instrument. Uh, and even if it is not so. Here you see the features of it. And uh, we uh, had three types of examinations uh, based on uh, the age brackets, from 0 to 40, from 41 to 60, and uh, over 60 years of age, selected by uh, the uh, device, uh, calculating them uh, and taking into account uh, the uh, physiological variation uh, of uh, the uh, perception threshold. This is a scheme of the visual field in the bottom in red, uh, the revisual, residual visual field uh, indicating uh, how much a visual field is left combining the points uh, with rel relevant importance. Uh, the more central the point is, the more important it is. Uh, and uh, stereopsis, uh, uh, you have uh, symbols uh, with decreasing levels of difficulty of perception connected uh, to the instance uh, of images. Uh, first level is the best, uh, 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, it's not an expression of time, uh, but it's a fraction of space uh, that defines uh, the distance of the images uh, shown. Sensitivity to contrast, uh, uh, five symbols uh, with the uh, five different levels, uh, and uh, uh, the evaluation uh, uh, is based on this uh, table. And time of recovery after glare, adaptation to darkness, uh, one minute total darkness, uh, glare for 30 se seconds, uh, light 100 lux, and uh, five symbols, uh, um, uh, five symbols, results, first, second, third level, depending on the time the subject uh, needs uh, uh, to have recovery after GRAER. Production of the Global Visual Index, uh, it is automatically performed uh, through the algorithm uh, that is preset in the software. Let's compare vision tester and traditional viewers. In my opinion, it's impossible because we speak about a completely different uh, uh, vision in terms of uh, precision, but also sensitivity and possibility to reproduce it. For example, in the case of the visual field, uh, we performed modulation of all the examination parameters, uh, supraliminal thresholds, the possibility to uh, show again uh, points not uh, seen, uh, evaluation of false positives and automatic calculation of the residual uh, visual field. And uh, you can uh, consider a non-digital technology viewer, you may immediately realize it's a new world. Uh, 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 and evaluation of uh, stereopsis, uh, and uh, so um, quantitative evaluation of the degree of stereopsis uh, through the measurement uh, uh, of uh, the uh, size of movement of images, uh, sensitivity to contrast, uh, and uh, we have the possibility to carefully define a contrast of images uh, uh, and the background. There's no environmental interference. Uh, we speak about virtual reality, a closed environment, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, constants of the contrast of images uh, not connected uh, to the level of wear of lighting systems uh, because uh, normal viewers are subject uh, to electrical changes uh, uh, and wear of components uh, recovery after glare total darkness uh, for a well-defined time and uh, uh, well defined uh, clear also in terms of time and for the first time ever we have introduced the concept uh, of uh, uh, time of recovery of best visual acuity but also best uh, sensitivity to contrast because uh, if uh, very good visual acuity if it is not supported uh, to efficient uh, um, uh, 
a contrast uh, sensitivity is of no use. At the end of the uh, evaluation, we have uh, uh, monofactorial uh, and multifactorial uh, uh, evaluation in the global uh, index, uh, and uh, at the end, uh, uh, the report is given to the patient. Which are the advantages? Uh, modulation and standardization of uh, examination criteria. Uh, it's uh, digital equipment uh, and reduction in examination time, uh, 10, 12 minutes. Uh, uh, it can be easily transported and uh, costs are less uh, than the costs of conventional instruments. Uh, and. Uh, to uh, perform the same evaluation uh, uh, with other instruments, uh, costs uh, would be four times higher. And uh, this instrument uh, uh, also defines a chromatic sense, uh, not just uh, defining uh, uh, possible problems, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, everything is quantified. Uh, specifically, as you can see in the schemes. We also have the possibility to perform another test other tests, for example, horizontal, vertical evaluation of heterophobias, and we can also perform a, a HES screen test with a, a, an incredible degree of precision, because on the one hand, we don't have the filters, colored lights, uh, and uh, on the other hand, we have fixed distance, because it's uh, non-real virtual distance in a HES screen, uh, 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 you may have completely different uh, results. Uh, potential use, uh, 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 driving license, uh, and uh, practice of motor sports. Uh, and uh, we shall uh, submit a paper to the World Conference on uh, Sport Medicine. Uh, and uh, so we can specifically assess uh, professional pilots uh, that need uh, highly customized uh, evaluation in the world of legal medicine and insurance. Uh, and uh, depending on the visual acuity, uh, everything changes. Uh, and uh, uh, occupational medicine uh, for a selection of staff uh, or uh, by optimizing uh, staff uh, depending on visual acuity. So this viewer, in a nutshell, as it is a screening instrument, it can be of great uh, use, not just for eye doctors, but all professional categories. Uh, when uh, they need uh, uh, to uh, assess uh, visual acuity, uh, and uh, let's make examples, uh, uh, optometrists, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in the evaluation of the visual field, uh, binocular visual field, we found uh, uh, right hemianopsia. Uh, a screening can be performed uh, by an optician that uh, uh, gives uh, such an input uh, uh, to the eye doctor to improve the synergy between uh, these uh, uh, two complementary professional figures. That's it. I've tried uh, to be as fast as possible. Thank, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Maybe we have a short Q&A session later. Roberto Tripodi from Essilor. I would like to thank uh, Professor Spinelli and all the panelists and the organizing committee for inviting me to take part in this workshop. Let's now upload the slides. I'm Roberto Tripodi, Professional Affairs at Essilor. Italy. Our communication is about the lens technologies and the vision solutions in transposing safety guidelines. So we have heard from previous panelists that the topic of safe driving and visual perspective 
perception are extremely important and 90 percent of the information that we process when driving are of visual type. We have already gone uh, through the visual process and driving uh, the level of luminosity, the features of the objects to be observed, uh, transparency of ocular uh, diopters, uh, resolution ability of uh, uh, the sight system, and then proper processing of all the information gathered. All of these elements are extremely important when it comes to safe driving. What are the uh, required uh, visual mechanisms? Visual acuity, contrast, uh, sensitivity, stereoscopic vision, color vision, and last but not least, uh, recovery or tolerance of glare and good night vision. Drivers every day go uh, through a set of conditions as we see here. Here we see some photos. But what are the main challenges? Well, seeing well means lots of things. One driver out of five doesn't see the road very well because of sight problems that have not been properly corrected. Uh, so, seeing well, what does it mean? Here we see several meanings. Uh, here you see driving speed in the top line of the table, the distance you cover and the reaction time of one second. And in red, you see the meters that are required before you completely stop your car, depending on the speed you are driving at. Another important aspect, glare is one of the crucial factors and one of the main causes for accidents, 120 kilometer, kilometers per hour, so you are covering 33 meters per second. And this is what it translates to night and twilight vision. Uh, this is uh, another very important uh, variable there. You need to have more lightness and proper lenses. Let's now move on uh, to evolution of uh, technologies in terms of driving safety and what sight lenses can do for better vision quality and also for speeding up reaction times. There are several light conditions that are described in this scheme. Here we have sensitivity curves in blue and night sensitivity of our eyes, the highest peak of sensitivity. In red, you see a day sensitivity. And uh, here you see some contributing factors like distances, uh, age, uh, of course, uh, a pupillar size, light, and amitropia, they all have a great impact on the quality of vision. Night vision, the rods are the retina photoreceptors that are mainly responsible for night vision. So we have a peak in the wavelength at 507 nanometers. So this is where we have the highest point in the curve. The rods are extremely sensitive and when they are irradiated by strong light and here we are referring to glare, they reach a, a saturation, so there is less comfort, of course. And at the same time, we have uh, less visual acuity. So when talking about optical solutions, so there are some uh, novelties. So anti-glare specific uh, treatment of lenses uh, for driving safety so that uh, this uh, correction uh, helps uh, make uh, the most uh, of our visual ability. The 
we are here targeting the specific wavelength uh, that we have here of 507 nanometer with a functional benefit. Uh, so we have, of course, less glare, 90% uh, less glare, better contrasts, better color uh, correspondence, uh, less proneness to glare also. Uh, at day, not only at night, and then of course appearance. We have this amber color, this amber reflex. Other solutions here, we are talking about other photochromatic lenses that can darker when driving. These are multifunctional lenses which don't get dark as sun glasses. They can only reach 50% of the darkness level, but this technology can be applied to any solution. There is a functional benefit, a greater visual acuity, more sensitivity to contrast, less photophobia, less glare, and of course also a nicer appearance. So then we have polarizing lenses. Here you see a good example of how we can enhance a contrast, enhance a safety, because glare is really disturbing drivers. And here, reaction time of uh, the driver with polarizing lenses improves uh, by three tenths of a second. So this allows the driver to stop uh, seven meters earlier when driving at 80 kilometers per hour. Not all lenses are the same. Not all lenses have been optimized for amitropia and for farsightedness. Normal monofocal lenses cannot fully manage certain light exposures. There are some constraints in the various vision areas and also in practical application. Monofocal lenses for driving, they use a technology like a sort of image filter so they can adjust to the changes in popular diameter with major benefits because we have clear sight sharp sight, greater luminosity, most of all at twilight, enhanced contrasts, and hence, we, if we select these technologies, we have a major benefit. Here you see a comparison between traditional monofocal solutions and the driving specific monofocal lenses. By way of parallel, let's look at uh, driving monofocal lenses and generic ones. In the traditional lenses, we have some constraints, most of all on the edges. There it's really difficult to see well if you are using rear mirrors. When talking about far-sightedness driving lenses, they have been developed um, not so much for correcting uh, far uh, near vision, but rather far vision, offering uh, an extremely broad visual field uh, for side uh, uh, mirrors or also when maneuvering. And uh, we have better focus uh, at typical distances if we are looking at the speedometer or the navigation system display. Let me just uh, close uh, with a comment. It's fundamental to see well at all distances and in any situation. My invitation is uh, for regular eye control and uh, eye prevention. Uh, uh, resorting to latest uh, materials and technologies for light exposure but also considering solutions that are really very specific to help us improve what we do. This is an invitation tonight. Uh, we will be talking about uh, road safety starting from uh, good vision at 5 p.m. We are going to present a specific program in cooperation with FIA. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.
at this point, uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, if you have uh, questions uh, to ask, if you want to make comments. Prego. Good morning, Dirino Mazzacane. I'm uh, an outpatients uh, uh, department, an outpatients department eye doctor. Congratulations uh, uh, to the speakers. Uh, personally, I have no personal interest, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in my family, uh, no one. Uh, uh, practices uh, this profession. And uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Giacotti. Uh, you've given an exhaustive uh, contribution, so full of personal examples. Uh, and uh, Dr. Giacotti has already dealt with a theme. The regulations for driving licenses is the result of an Italian-style path that started in 2005-2006 and uh, it went on in uh, such a way uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, a very uh, uh, sad end. Uh, the main purpose uh, is just saving. And uh, every year 5 million driving licenses are issued. There's a problem of costs as a consequence. Uh, congratulations uh, for having invited uh, young students. Uh, uh, this initiative uh, is uh, extremely worthy and education uh, uh, of people uh, is fundamental. Dr. Giacotti uh, stressed a very important uh, role, uh, the uh, role of uh, general practitioners. I'm 62 years old and uh, our age is quite similar. General practitioners in the past uh, made uh, uh, diagnoses uh, and uh, now uh, general practitioners no longer uh, examine uh, uh, eyes. And uh, uh, people came to us uh, for driving licenses and uh, you knew patients. Uh, and instead, in the case of uh, uh, present mechanism, you have a physician uh, playing a specific role, but the patients he meets, uh, uh, well, are not his own patients. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know from uh, Dr. Uh, Giacotti how uh, he considers uh, a renewal of uh, driving licenses uh, uh, should be managed uh, and uh, the type of professional figures uh, that should be involved in issuing uh, driving licenses. Uh, 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 and uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, for the a technological inauguration, inauguration and uh, uh, what uh, you have said uh, is of great interest and uh, the solutions uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, by Dr. Tripodi uh, Essilor uh, are extremely interesting but we are in Lombardy A few days after what was stated, uh, uh, optical centers uh, should uh, aim at prevention. Uh, so we speak about uh, amblyopias and children and kids and uh, uh, issuance of uh, uh, driving licenses. Uh, I have some doubts and uh, I'm at a loss after certain uh, statements uh, made. Uh, uh, I have a role in a trade union. I represent uh, a medical uh, uh, registry of Milan and uh, I, I am active in various uh, scientific societies. So uh, they spoke about a complementary role. I do not want to wage a war against uh, anybody. Uh, uh, what I aim at is protection of all citizens. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Dr. Sanjuolo, who should use the instrument and who should do what? 
I give a reply on behalf of everybody, otherwise uh, it takes too long. I'd like to say that Società Italiana di Ophthalmologia uh, uh, has a specific committee and it includes uh, eye doctors but a set of uh, professional figures and uh, it is specifically dealing with this problem and next year it will raise uh, uh, questions uh, to the Ministry of Health and competent ministries. Do we have other questions? I'd like to give an answer uh, to my colleague. The procedure is extremely simple. The eye doctor should be uh, the only uh, doctor uh, involved and uh, the eye doctor should take uh, socio-economic and legal responsibilities uh, uh, in terms of certification and uh, uh, this uh, uh, professional figure should have a precise uh, uh, technical instrument uh, and uh, if, for example, uh, a car accident uh, occurs, if the patient is an amblyope patient uh, uh, and uh, the insurance company uh, would uh, have the possibility uh, to ask uh, uh, damages uh, uh, from uh, uh, the eye doctor if the certification uh, uh, is uh, counterfeited. Other questions? A very brief question. Uh, Dr. Tripodi. Such lenses uh, uh, developed for driving, how have they been developed and how have they been tested? Did I get your question well? Uh, how such lenses uh, have been developed and also tested? On the basis of which data can we say that they're better than other lenses? Uh, we have a set of, uh, obviously, materials and data, uh, as was shown uh, in the case of polarizing lenses. And we have uh, papers, uh, studies uh, on reactivity, but also Mm, uh, technology applied uh, to lenses, uh, patent, and so on and so forth. There's a relationship between traditional technologies and uh, uh, highly specialized uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, hence, uh, you have an improvement in terms of quality uh, of the various parameters. Uh, it's just like uh, uh, there were specific specifications uh, for visual requirements of drivers, but those numerical data, do you get them from tests <coughs> performed uh, uh, during uh, driving or in simulators? Uh, uh, theoretically and practically as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we should thank Mido uh, for inviting us. Uh, we'd like to thank you all. If you want to have additional uh, information about us, uh, you can Google Vision Plus Onlus uh, and uh, uh, you get every information. Thank you so much.